opportunity to uh, talk to you about uh, what we've been doing in Scotland for a number of years now. Um, I've entitled this brief presentation Fill in the Gap because the most recent piece of legislation, the Alice Court Protection Bill, which came in to force in 2008, was really the, the last piece of sort of social legislation that had come as a result of uh, the Scottish Parliament. Protection for people with incapacity issues, we have protection for people with mental health and learning disabilities, but those who are frail, older but with capacity, or those unable to protect themselves from harm and abuse, or subject to exploitation or neglect, were still not the general principles behind it. Uh, the Scottish Government does insist that any new legislation has to be underpinned on, sound ethical, on a sound ethical basis. So section 1 of the Act suggests that intervention must provide benefit to the adult and that action should be most supportive and least restrictive. Having been involved in giving uh, evidence to the Health Committee uh, when the bill was going through Parliament, it was obvious that politicians were concerned, as no doubt is the case here, about the, if you like, the reach of the state, the encouragement of the nanny state intervening in people's lives. There was a lot of concern from various disability lobbies that this was turning the clock back. It was going to intervene in people's lives in a way that individuals might not find helpful. So the question of language was very important. The word abuse was not able to be used in the act. That's where the word harm had to be substituted. It was a feeling that we didn't want to have these pejorative statements suggesting that people were abusing each other. So it was softened a bit by the use of the word harm, but for harm we need abuse. It was also that important to stress the support elements within the Act, because it's about prevention as well as about cure. So two of the Act must have regard to the wishes of the adult, the nearest relative, carer or guardian. It's very important to have the adult's participation and to ensure that adults are not treated less favourably. And you take account of the adult's abilities, background and characteristics. So what did the Act bring in? Well, it, it brought in rather important powers. The ones that were perhaps seen as rather controversial. And the ones I suppose that are perhaps something that yourself will have to consider in terms of your own Act or your own bill. It allows for uh, local authorities to investigate suspected harm to carry out assessments of the adult and their circumstances in terms of assessment orders, to intervene to remove the adult or manage the risk of harm by through removal orders, and if necessary, and as a last resort, to exclude the perpetrator of the AR banning orders, and if necessary, to force entry to perform any of the above. For that, we abuse. But any conduct which causes physical harm, conduct which causes psychological harm, and unlawful conduct which appropriates or adversely affects property rights or interests of individuals. And any conduct which causes self harm. Mm -hmm. It is very important to get the consent of the adult. However, but refusal to consent can be ignored where it is believed that the adult has been unduly pressurised to refuse consent and that no other step could reasonably be taken with the adult's consent to protect. And again, this has to be balanced by situations where an older person is looked after perhaps by a son or daughter, and there is a refusal by that person to allow access to the person. And the person is probably agreeing with their, 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 their son or daughter. But if you believe that they have been unduly pressurised to agree to or not to agree to, then you can apply to the sheriff have that uh, um, consent. Along with the legislation in 2008 came national training material. It was very important to try and ensure that all those who were going to be involved in adult protection understood the guiding principles behind the legislation and also the powers that uh, were to be used so that everybody understood what their roles and responsibilities were. The right legal framework and it does ensure the practice, which I think is what uh, we're now seeing results of should improve. So it's about balancing appropriate intervention against three elements. It's about capacity, rights and choice. And it's about trying to achieve appropriate protection. Inevitably, you can't always get it right. But 
I think what we're finding, as I'll show you in the next couple of slides, is that the evidence of what has been happening in terms of the activities of orders being taken, you will see that there's been quite a dramatic rise in the, the work that I've this legal framework has brought about an attention to the, this a situation that wouldn't have been the case with the legislation. A considerable amount of referrals leading to a significant amount of inquiries and a lesser amount of investigations. And if you then look at the number of orders that have been taken, there are all the concerns about whether or not there would be significant numbers of people either being taken into care or having to uh, have uh, their spouses uh, or their carers removed. The fact is that the evidence so far has backed that up. So what we have is, if you like, the tapering effect. Many people being referred, significant, of significant numbers of inquiries being undertaken. Investigations then following from that, but the number of orders that have been taken have been significantly less than one might have expected. But I think the way in which the legislation has been framed, that is the outcome that we wanted to achieve. But you wouldn't be expecting to have significant numbers of assessment orders and removal orders. The one that's been most significant is banning orders. Uh, and that probably has been the most frequently used uh, of the orders that are now available. 